So good morning to everyone. I'd like to, uh, to welcome you all to, to UBC's uh, uh, CADA Open House. Let me just uh, first begin by acknowledging that the, uh, the land on which we work from at the UBC Point Grey campus uh, is the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of, of the Musqueam people. Um, so the Musqueam people have been, uh, as you know, living in the Vancouver area for, for thousands of years uh, before the arrival of, of Europeans. Um, just uh, uh, to make this more personal, I myself uh, am, a, am effectively a settler uh, with my family originally from the Netherlands and uh, before growing up in, in Canada. And so uh, I too, am, I'm benefiting from the, the colonization and uh, exploitation of indigenous, indigenous lands uh, and communities. Um, it's really up to, to each of us to, to find our own uh, uncomfortable path to, to dealing with the fact that, that we are living uh, on land that is unceded. And so uh, meaning that land was not turned over to the crown or government uh, by any, uh, any treaty or, or other agreement. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so that, that's an uncomfortable uh, situation that we all have to make our own path uh, towards a re uh, reconciliation um, over, over, uh, over thousands of years or, or, or hundreds of years of, of colonization. With that having said that, uh, let me start by uh, by pointing out that CAIDA is UBC's main AI research organization with over 100 professors and, and their research teams uh, spanning 24 different departments and units at uh, UBC. Uh, so AI is of course uh, a very broad term. And so UBC's particular strength and expertise is reflected in, in the name of our organization. So, so we call ourselves the, the Center for AI Decision-Making and Action. Uh, that is to say, in order for AI to, to truly have impact, the uh, intelligence of any system uh, can't just sit in an isolated box, but it needs to be used in support of making decisions and, and taking actions to, to have impact uh, in the real world. Um, so uh, let me briefly describe uh, CADA's uh, mission, which is, uh, which is really both deep and broad. And so by deep, uh, I, I point to the, the significant strength that we have in, in fundamental AI methods. Uh, so this, this refers to the, the, the mathematical and theoretical foundations for, for systems that can uh, learn, predict, and, and take actions in the world. And, and this includes much of uh, uh, core fundamentals in, in machine learning. Uh, and so by broad, I point to the many areas that, that CADA members uh, work on. And so, so this includes AI and health, AI and uh, visual computing, uh, as you know, we, we have a, a very large visual effects uh, and games industry here in, in, the, uh, in, in British Columbia. Uh, AI in manufacturing. And so, uh, as you'll hear in, I believe, in one of the, uh, in one of the plenary talks, we, we, uh, uh, there are strong collaborations going with, uh, with uh, a carbon curing and manufacturing. Uh, collaborations with uh, Boeing, for example, uh, AI and economics, um, AI and, and uh, AI and, and natural resources. And so you'll see that this is also reflected in, in today's lab overviews, uh, keynotes, and, uh, and panel. Um, so what you'll be seeing today is really just a snapshot of, of the broad range of activities uh, that are happening uh, within CADA at, uh, at UBC. Uh, let me also just point out that uh, CADA is at the heart of, of both training and research efforts uh, related to AI at UBC. And so the, the, the training component is also, of course, incredibly important given the strong technology and AI, and AI ecosystems uh, in uh, Vancouver and more broadly in uh, BC. Um, so in, in a fast moving high impact area, uh, like what we're seeing currently in, when, in AI and machine learning, uh, this is, uh, of course, th there is, of course, an incredible demand for training, and so CADA is working hard to, to uh, meet the, uh, the significant demand uh, for training in this area. I'm excited to say that uh, UBC is continuing to make a really significant uh, a number of hires around AI, and so this spans uh, multiple, multiple departments, including uh, computer science, uh, math, uh, electrical and computer engineering, uh, statistics and uh, and several more departments uh, as well. Uh, you also have a, a you'll have a chance to hear from some of the new faculty today, although uh, th there just isn't enough time to to hear from all of them. 
So uh, let, let me wrap up by pointing out that by, by virtue of being an open house event, the, uh, the overall theme is indeed that of, of, uh, of outreach and providing everyone with a snapshot of, of some of the many activities that are happening at UBC. And so in, in that spirit, I, I strongly encourage everyone uh, watching to, to engage with the speakers uh, to the extent uh, that you can today. Um, and that we can via Zoom. Um, so during the time available for questions and, and also uh, for uh, follow-up afterwards, either in person or we'll actually finish the day with a, uh, with a social event uh, that I believe starts at 2 p.m. So with uh, all that said, I believe that uh, we are ready to get started. And so um, we're got the, as you've probably know from the schedule, the, the first um, the opening event is that of lab tours. And so lab tours are, are really just uh, a, a proxy for what we might do in an actual open house where you could actually physically visit the labs. And so uh, in, in, in the current era, we'll have to make do with, uh, with, uh, with some exciting uh, lab overview talks, uh, which will be just long enough to, to give you a flavor of, of what uh, many folks are, are working on. Uh, so we'll launch into the, the first lab uh, overview. And so th this will be given by uh, Kwang Mu Yi. And so uh, he's an assistant professor in the Department of Com Computer Science at UBC. And so he's a member of the, uh, the Computer Vision Lab, uh, CADA and, uh, and ISICS. Um, he has his PhD from Seoul National University and did postdoctoral work at, uh, at EPFL in uh, Switzerland. And after that, he worked a, as an assistant professor at the University of Victoria before joining uh, UBC recently. Uh, he serves as area chair for top computer vision conferences, including uh, CVPR, ICCV, and ECCV, uh, as well as for, uh, for uh, uh, AAAI, the AAAI conference. And he, he will also be one of the upcoming organizers uh, for CVPR 2023. Uh, so with that, uh, let's uh, let me pass the uh, the podium over to Kwang Mu. Hi, um, thank you, Michael, for the nice introduction. I'll just try to spotlight myself so that I get to get the majority of the screen assets. So um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do in our group, and uh, hopefully, it will get some I'll give you some idea of. Uh, what we're doing in terms of uh, low-level computer vision and geometry in um, Kaida. So I'm going to talk about mostly about uh, 3D geometries, and this is actually the main research theme of our group. So we are very much interested in how uh, learning how does the world look like in 3D, or if you include time, that would also include uh, the time dimension, so it would be 4D, but you get the idea. So we're interested in the geometry of scenes. And uh, of course, being a computer vision uh, focus group, we rely on cameras and visual sensors. For example, that camera over there, taking a photo, we want to figure out how uh, the world looks like and where, did our, where are our cameras so that we can actually re react and interact with the environment later on. And um, one of the main things that we do is since so using just single camera means that you're just snapshotting the uh, scene from one direction and that destroys the depth information. So we do use multiple cameras in most of our research and um, the research question revolves around how do we actually get the 3D geometry of the scene like the building in the middle versus uh, from those two images. And mostly what traditional methods have been doing in these cases would be to try to relate between, for example, these two, uh, well, three red dots here, so that you can actually make use of the fact that the light travels in a straight line, well, mostly, and then uh, you can do some math around it to get the complicated physical uh, relationship between the camera and the scene and all those nice goodies. And uh, one of the, first research questions that needs to be addressed when you do this is actually to figure out where do we actually look at. So where, we, where in the image should we look at to find those red dots there that we can make use of. And our group has been doing a lot of research in that domain, quite a lot uh, shown here. And uh, one of the things that we've been doing was to replace what 
computer vision researchers have been doing for like 10, 15 years uh, with the AI uh, powered, like machine learning powered methods, um, which uh, created a line of work that we were, um, it's just the humble brag that one of the first people ever to make this actually happen. And uh, of course, uh, finding interesting points to re reason about the 3D geometry actually resolves around this problem of where do we actually look at in images to make, do things? So this is one of the uh, extensions that we had from just looking at these points and finding geometry to making sense out of images by looking at, again, some interesting points in the image. And uh, this is a work that we're going to actually present this summer um, at uh, CVPR, one of the major venues in computer vision and machine learning. And uh, what we show is that you can actually bring the uh, domain knowledge that you had and create somewhat an AI flow that will actually learn to discover where important things are without us ever telling where to look at. So we just tell that there's a cat in this image and the AI system will actually learn to find that on its own which was one of the uh, very interesting things that we wanted to do uh, in our group for a long time and we finally got to do it. And of course, uh, doing this all involves um, high level things, but also very small, subtle, low level things like just enlarging this image. That also requires some special attention and we've, uh, our group also works on those um, more image level operations that are suitable for AI purposes as well. So uh, that's the first question that we look at. And um, even though you have solved the first question, I am not claiming that we did, but even though we have good things for the first question, it's quite obvious that you need to use them. So you need to know that those red dots correspond. So that's the second research question that we are pretty much interested in our group. And uh, we've had, again, a lot of work where we start from trying to do the ransack thing on the far, far left, which is like 1980s thing. And we imbued it with AI trying to mine what's good and bad in these lines that connect between the two images and ask the AI to figure out what uh, things that we should focus on. And the result is in the middle where we have more green lines with the green lines here denote uh, correct, correct matches coming from the system that matches to physical uh, these points between images. And you can see that we have a bit of a uh, enhanced improvement as we go on as uh, shown in this work over there, which is what we did last year. And here again, the main thing that we're doing is to look into data and try to learn what is important in the data that we could extract to solve for these image matching problems. And uh, more recently, we've also been able to do that with more uh, powerful AI, uh, not just for those scenes that you've seen before, but it turns out you can also train something that works on those scenes and work on various other scenes. For example, uh, using those techniques, we can remember I'm interested in geometry, so we can build like 3D scenes like so, or um, like that, even from two different photos of the things from very different days or probably different cameras, we can still try to reconstruct the 3D just from two images as the following. Well, of course, if you get more images, you get more higher quality. And the interesting thing is just matching images in 3D, the technique can also translate into, for example, uh, tracking facial features in, our, in people. And of course, that could bring some interesting things. Like you've probably seen people acting and turning that into different 3D things as well. And then of course, uh, these wild transformations are also something that you can track to relate between frames. And you can also put some nice graphics applications here as well. And speaking of, of which, uh, now we know how to go find interesting points, relate images, go to 3D, but we need to know how to store them as well. Right? So uh, another part of the research that we do is to learn to abstract 3D information into a small set of numbers for like, just a few hundred numbers and then learn how to expand it back. And this work over here um, is actually a collaboration with the University of Toronto, Google, and a, a lot of, um, uh, a bit of a big collaboration we did where we 
learn how we could segment and partition the uh, 3D point cloud into a consistent set of points, regardless of how it's posed or how its um, small details change. And the interesting thing is to do that, we needed to build some sort of a mental frame that all these analysis gets to be processed in. And um, um, if you're interested, this work is also online. And it was quite interesting that that mental frame was critical in achieving uh, highly meaningful or highly qu high quality reconstructions. And um, finally, since we have all the 3D things, how to go from 2D to 3D, it's natural that we want to go from 3D to 2D so that we form the full cycle, right? So we want our machine learning based techniques to go from images to 3D and come back to 2D so that we can actually then try to relate this full cycle with how the physical world should behave. So the last missing puzzle, we've recently been able to do this thing called decompose radiance fields, uh, which is a, a class of methods that try to use machine learning to do rendering, but at the same time use some of the techniques that people have been using in the rendering, uh, in the rendering pipeline within uh, like to merge with the machine learning stuff. And here, um, what we're doing is trying to uh, decompose the scene into bit, multiple blocks and then using that um, render scenes and draw the scene as if we are drawing a painting. And it turns out if you do that, those uh, techniques that you've done during your painting classes might actually let you uh, do an efficient way of rendering 3D scenes, even in like AI systems. And finally, uh, we don't only do 3D to 2D, we can actually do 2D to 3D for a known scene easily. For example, uh, we know that a soccer field follows a certain uh, set of rules. So we can actually relate just by looking at the soccer scene, how the camera is looking at the scene and then uh, try to augment things on top. For example, the soccer field back, um, um, the drawing overlay that I'm showing here. And uh, the accuracy of the camera pose estimation will actually allow you to get more accurate things. And um, I'm just showing this video, which shows a side-by-side -side comparison of what uh, used to be done on the what, what could be done on the right hand side. And of course, the one that works better on the right hand side is our stuff. And interestingly, even though we don't have any like notion of which frame goes first than that, it all really works quite well uh, and accurately. So that later on, um, maybe you would hate me for this, but you can also put nice ads here um, that could make the game more interesting or analysis on top. You've probably seen all these things in football games recently anyways. So those are the main research questions that drive our group. Of course, we have other more interesting things, but I'm, I only have 10 minutes to show things. So I'm gonna uh, stop here. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to ask. And I just want to mention that behind all these work, I've only briefly been able to show it, but it's actually uh, thanks to a lot of our wonderful graduate students and our team, as well as uh, the collaborators that's behind me, um, uh, which I was very, very fortunate enough to have a chance to get to work with. Okay, thank you so much, and I'll be happy to take your questions. Okay, I'm happy to uh, to feel free to to post uh, questions either via chat or uh, that's probably the most convenient way. Or else, uh, also we can just uh, please uh, you can raise your hand or um, or just uh, open your mic. I, I'll start off with with just just a question about uh, scalability scalability and so. So, to what extent uh, do, do do the methods that you're describing really scale to to just really large data sets and and uh, just opening it up to yeah like it, uh, what are the challenges related to scalability? So uh, for the two uh, D to three D part, it's actually a little bit more scalable uh, than the three D to two D because the two D to three D result uh, result revolves around just uh, matching two images and then trying to relate them and then having a process that ties them all together to become 3D. So that part 
is scalable given that you have enough compute because there is a n by n square combination of things given n images that you could actually relate. So that's a that's a bit of the tricky part in scalability there. So there are things like people do to reduce that search space on the pairs. And for the 3D to 2D part, um, the rendering actually takes quite a while, but then more recent works have shown that with clever engineering, you can make all those rendering things to go real time. And at the same time, our work actually focuses on the scalability problem. We're decomposing the scene into multiple bits. So in fact, it, it, theoretically, we haven't tried this, but theoretically, you could decompose a very large scene into a very uh, large number of components and only render a few, and it will still render quite well. Okay, great. Um, so, and, and uh, I don't, uh, I'm still looking for other questions. Uh, feel free to ask. Um, I, I, I do have another one actually. So the, if, um, to what extent does where you look at depend on, on your advanced knowledge of, of what it is that you're looking at? So if I'm looking at a tree versus a, a hallway with mirrors, um, the, the features that I'll look at will, will be very different. And so can you, can you describe anything related to, to conditioning on this prior knowledge to, to, to make the rec to, to make the, uh, the understanding process faster or better? Yeah, that's actually a great point. And uh, because, for example, right now, the two things that we've been doing was to just say indoors and outdoors. That was the drastic uh, difference in conditions. But for sure, depending on the task at hand or uh, what you're, uh, the environment you're in, it's clear that you probably want to do this process in a different way. And that's why we created the learning-based methods in the first place so that we condition them. And uh, so far we haven't had an automatic condition thing because it turns out for outdoor scenes, just having one outdoor <laughs> local feature seemed to be uh, good enough. And indoors, uh, again, an indoors one was good enough. But um, I, I was quite inspired by a recent talk by Jeffrey Hinton about the GLOM thing, where he does say that uh, you might want to have high level task and low level task talk to each other. And, and uh, that's actually an active area that we're investigating to see if we, since we have the pipeline differentiable, we are able to like do these, all these mathematical tricks to relate between tasks and pr primitive processing. And uh, yeah, that's actually an um, active thing that we're trying to do and to try to see if it makes a difference. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that you mentioned that that recent work uh, because yeah, I do find that uh, yeah, here. <laughs> yeah, 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 to to some extent, uh, in recent reading, it seems that uh, that a lot of work in machine learning is 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 rediscovering, you know, just how important it is to have to have relative transformations. Uh, that that we've been using uh, that of course uh, have been used for a long time in in graphics robotics and, and vision and and just how important it is to to be able to have these these different coordinate frames as, as anchors for interpreting the scenes uh, any comments on on that yeah that's um yeah that's actually uh quite interesting yeah i've i'm i the the frame coordinate framework is actually with uh my good um graphics collaborator, uh, Andrea over here. And uh, right. you can see where the intuition actually comes from, but because he's been playing around with coordinates for a long while. And um, uh, I think uh, this sort of a merge between the um, close, but not exactly the same areas and different point of views are actually quite important these days because of these sort of framework being important, all these intuitions. Uh, actually paying off. So yeah, I, I'm really like happy with these uh, novel views uh, try and, and trying to apply them to what we have right now. Okay, and uh, one last quick question and then we'll move on. So uh, question from chat, is your research being applied to real life applications uh, and how do you collaborate with industry players? So I wouldn't say real life, but uh, we did have one of our projects being applied to a European pro um, project where they were trying to build an AR uh, system to help educate 
uh, new new engineers in a hazardous environment. For example, it was for the particle accelerator. There's radiation down there, so the experts cannot always go in and teach. So they were building this uh, AR device that could help uh, teach them what to do in those uh, particle accelerators. So that's one of the things that people were doing, and um, and I think also these matching systems. I've uh, I know that. Um, some of the companies um, have partnered with some of the follow-up works that we had, uh, follow-up works that were inspired from our work, and uh, they are actively using in a live system. I was happy to hear that, except, um, yeah, I didn't earn a dime because it was not exactly my work, so <laughs> that was a little bit sad, but, but it's, still, it's still quite cool that these things seem to be actually being used. So okay, and, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so so we'll we'll have a, a great chance to to actually learn a little bit more about industry uh, various industry interaction models in, in the panel. And so, uh, but yeah. So yeah. In, in the interest of time, we'll we'll move on. And uh, and many thanks for for uh, an excellent uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Great. Okay. So uh, we'll uh, we'll now move on to uh, to the next presentation, which will be in lab uh, lab overview, which will be by uh, Bushan uh, Gopaluni. So he's a professor in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering. Uh, he's also uh, uh, serving as associate dean uh, for education and professional de development in in the Faculty of Applied Science at UBC. Uh, he has affiliations with UBC's uh, Institute for Applied Mathematics, uh, at the Pulp and Paper Center, as well as the Clean Energy Research Center. Uh, he received his PhD from uh, University of Alberta in, in 2003 in chemical engineering. And uh, yeah, so he, he has uh, designed and worked, uh, helped develop uh, controllers, many controllers for BC's uh, pulp and paper industry and uh, and further many monitoring uh, projects uh, related to oil and gas and other chemical industries. And uh, I'll conclude by saying he, uh, he also has one of the best uh, lab tour titles, uh, Dancing with Data and Engineers uh, Cho Cho Choreography. Uh, th thank you, Michael. But I'm not sure if I'm going to do justice to the title. It was difficult to put together a presentation that would do justice to this title. But anyways, uh, thank you for the introduction. And I also want to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to speak uh, at this event. Uh, as uh, Michael said, I'm a professor in chemical and biological engineering, and I specialize in data analytics and process control. Um, let's imagine a future manufacturing or industrial plant that has uh, cloud onboard AI enabled intelligence, connected assets, per assets perhaps uh, self-diagnosing, um, adaptive maintenance-free controllers, virtual assistants, virtual reality enabled controlled rooms, all of this while maintaining a high level of safety and reliability uh, by uh, maximizing efficiency in terms of minimizing costs and maximizing profits. The question I want to pose to you today is, is this level of automation possible in the process industries or manufacturing industries? In other words, can we build self-driving uh, manufacturing and industrial plants? The current state of art involves uh, hundreds of uh, engineers and uh, operators working around the clock at these plants to uh, just keep them uh, running smoothly. They're not even uh, often uh, trying to optimize the operation of these plants. However, uh, with a different level or higher level of automation, uh, we believe uh, we, can, um, uh, we can derive uh, more profits or run these processes uh, much better, uh, much better. So the question that I want to pose is, is that type of a future plan possible? There's a lot of optimism in the industry right now that with the advances in machine learning and the data that is available, that we can create these uh, processes with a high level of automation. As you all know, data revolution is around us. Uh, almost every piece of equipment and every sensor you can find in the industry uh, can be connected to internet. It's possible to generate large volumes of data uh, through these uh, industrial internet of things. There's already a data deluge. A lot of these industries are sitting on treasure troves of data without fully utilizing their value. There's also enormous computing power that we have that did not exist just a few years ago. And we've also seen major algorithmic advances in machine learning and artificial intelligence in just last uh, 
uh, few years. So it's the serendipitous confluence of Internet of Things, computing power, and advanced algorithms that has led to this optimism around um, a new level of automation in the process industries. And in fact, uh, a lot of people believe that we are at the dawn of uh, the fourth industrial revolution, which some people refer to as Industry 4.0. There are different pieces to the puzzle of Industry 4.0, but in my research group, we focus primarily on four different lines of research, which I'm going to uh, uh, explain in the next few slides. We work with a wide range of industries, uh, industries in the natural resource sector that include oil and gas industries, pulp and paper, and mining industries. We work with uh, biotechnology and pharmaceutical industries. Uh, we also work with a lot of companies that are in the area of uh, uh, smart uh, cities. Uh, we are interested in uh, developing uh, machine learning or AI algorithms for space and energy management. We work with uh, uh, companies in the clean energy sector. In particular, uh, we are uh, working on developing advanced battery management systems uh, for uh, lithium ion batteries. Now, the common thread among all of these industries or applications is that they are all dynamic systems and they generate large volumes of data. And in fact, Complex industrial processes, manufacturing plants, they generate enormous volumes of heterogeneous data that include uh, time series data, categorical data, images, videos, text, and so on. However, these processes are extremely complex, highly interconnected, and therefore it's often very difficult to build phenomenological or mechanistic models. And in fact, in some cases, building these phenomenological or mechanistic models takes uh, many years. Uh, and often they're not accurate enough to use uh, for optimization or control purposes. So we primarily focus on building uh, data-based models from large volumes of industrial data. These processes are also characterized by high nonlinearity, stochasticity. There are a lot of unknown components in these processes and they often exhibit uh, dynamic behavior. So our, our goal in, in, my in our research group is to pursue primarily four, <clears throat> four different lines of research uh, to uh, tackle these challenges in the industrial sectors that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the first line of research that we pursue is that of uh, data visualization. Uh, I believe that uh, in a, a lot of problems, visualizing the data in the right way and presenting it in the right way to operators and engineers would solve uh, problems um, easily without even, uh, without even building uh, machine learning models, even before you build machine learning models. So our research group is really interested in understanding what is the maximum amount of information that you can extract with already existing uh, data by simply visualizing it. A good example of that is uh, an interesting problem uh, related to model predictive controllers. Model predictive controllers are large scale optimization-based controllers that are widely used in industrial processes. There is an underlying complex optimization. Uh, in the particular example that I'm, uh, this is a heat map of uh, uh, what is called a pivoted uh, data matrix from a model predictive controller. Uh, this particular model predictive controller has 50 inputs, 100 outputs, or in other words, there are roughly 5,000 different interactions between inputs and outputs. And these controllers behave in ways that are not intuitive because there is an underlying optimization problem that they're solving. And operators and engineers often get confused and tend to turn off these controllers because uh, if they don't understand how the controller is behaving, uh, they, they, they try to use their intuition and previous or a priori knowledge to operate these large industrial plants. And that is obviously not optimal. So we designed this visualization tool that allows operators to visualize uh, the optimization problem that the model predictive controller is solving and use that information to diagnose uh, unknown or unexpected behavior of model predictive controllers. What you see here is um, a heat map of what is called a pivoted matrix. Um, you, we can also uh, visualize uh, the constraints on the controller. We can visualize uh, different types of information uh, that is used in the controller and that is generated by the controller. So we've used these visualization tools uh, to solve a variety of uh, different types of problems. And in fact, we've used uh, our colleague, uh, Professor Munzner's uh, uh, 
uh, ideas on data visualization in tackling some of these problems. Uh, we've tried that uh, not just with time series data, we've tried that with uh, images on different types of problems, but at the core of uh, the research into visualization is uh, the question, how much uh, information can we extract from these large volumes of data uh, even before we start building uh, uh, machine learning models? The second class of problems uh, or the second line of research that we are interested in is that of building large scale models. And it's, uh, uh, th these models are sometimes referred to as digital twins. As I mentioned earlier, large industrial uh, complexes are, you know, they are highly interconnected. There are lots of things that are happening simultaneously. In the past, uh, we have primarily built models on individual units, but right now with the tools we have and the amount of data we have, we believe that we can build large scale models from existing historical data to simulate these industrial processes, to predict how they're going to behave in the future, and also to optimize and control them under uncertainty. That's the second line of research uh, that, that we are pursuing. The third line of research is around fault detection, diagnosis, and predictive analytics. These industrial processes have um, large volumes of data. As I mentioned earlier, it's heterogeneous. A lot of times things go wrong. They don't uh, work as expected. Then we go and do post-mortem analysis to identify faults and who also identify uh, the causes of these faults. In other words, there, there could be a variety of factors that have led to a certain abnormal situation. We use uh, a lot different types of machine learning tools to sift through that data and identify uh, what factors have caused these faults in the process. Uh, we also do uh, predictive analytics. Uh, we, it's, it's not just about uh, figuring out what has happened, what had gone wrong in the past. We also use these tools to, uh, to identify uh, or to predict what might happen in the future. And a good example of that is uh, um, uh, what you see on the right-hand side here. We used a, a spiral. This is a clever idea by one of my students to use this spiral to show different steps that we undertake in order to arrive at a solution to the problem. So let me describe what the problem is. On the top right-hand corner, you see an electric furnace. This is an electric furnace in a mining process. In this furnace, there are two electrodes. Uh, it is used to melt uh, copper ore. Uh, there is an arc that is formed between the electrode and the top or the surface of the molten material. And every once in a while in this uh, particular plant, they lose the electric arc. And when they lose the electric arc, they have to shut down the electric furnace. And that is going to, that, that results in roughly 15 to 20 minutes of loss in production time. Uh, and over a year, this turns out to about uh, a month of, uh, production time uh, that, is, that is lost. So our goal was to use the data generated from this process. It had about uh, uh, 100 sensors. Uh, we had access to uh, gigabytes of data. We wanted to use that data in order to predict when these arc losses are going to happen. Because if the operators and engineers on site, they know that an arc loss is imminent, they can take actions to prevent that arc loss. So we built, uh, we went through the, the workflow that we developed is uh, sort of shown in this uh, spiral here. It'll take me an hour to explain what it is. But at the end of the day, uh, we built a machine learning model uh, that was able to predict these arc losses five minutes in advance with 75% probability. So these are uh, uh, the fault detection and diagnosis or predictive analytics problems uh, that we are interested in solving. And the last line of research that we are interested in is around optimization and control. How do we operate these industrial processes optimally under uncertainty? We use a variety of optimization and control tools. These include uh, deep and meta reinforcement learning. Um, the, the figure at the bottom on the left-hand side uh, shows, uh, uh, figure one shows prior art, what is normally done in the industries today. There is an industrial process, it's controlled by a controller, and uh, there are people, engineers and others who are designing these controllers, uh, commissioning them and maintaining them. There's a lot of effort that goes into uh, maintaining these controllers. Uh, what we are doing right now is replacing the human element there with reinforcement learning tools so that uh, maintenance of these controllers is completely automated. Uh, what you see on the right-hand side is a pilot-scale setup that Honeywell 
where we have uh, uh, two uh, level tanks that we are trying to control using uh, deep and meta reinforcement learning algorithms. So in order to move towards uh, the, developing these uh, intelligent processes or creating uh, a high level of automation in the process uh, industries, we're working on uh, these four different types of problems, large scale dynamic models, maintenance free controllers. Uh, we are in, uh, developing algorithms for automatic detection and diagnosis of faults and uh, for predictive analytics. However, there are a number of challenges uh, often big data are confused with good data. That is not the case, particularly with uh, industrial processes. There are a variety of computational challenges. There is existing uh, computational infrastructure in these industries that are not amenable to machine learning tools. Um, in the process industries, performance and stability guarantees are extremely important, and those uh, issues are not yet solved. Uh, there are also a lot of uh, uh, mathematical underlying mathematical problems that are proving to be difficult. So in my research group, uh, we are focused not only on applications, but also on the underlying uh, mathematical uh, algorithms and tools that are required to solve these problems. Uh, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much, Michael. I hope I stayed within my 12 minutes. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, no, no, that's perfect. Uh, great. We do have time for, uh, for questions. And so please uh, post your questions to chat or uh raise a hand or, or open your mic. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask, uh, so in practice, uh, what kinds of issues uh, are, do you face when taking a method that's been developed in, in, in a simulated scenario and transferring that to the real world or the, the, the so-called sim to real problem for, for the types mm -hmm. of problems that, that you're looking at? And, and, and then maybe related to that, uh, how much better do you have to be in terms of improved performance that that you might offer be, before before the industry that you're working with a, a actually cares because obviously there, there's also a risk to them of of taking on a, a new ideas and 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 methodologies yeah you know that that's that's a great question um so let, let me answer your first question uh which is around you know one of the challenges with uh, applying machine learning tools in the real industry. So one problem that I don't think has really been solved uh, by computer scientists or you know, statisticians and others is uh, what is good data, right? If you think about robots by design, they're supposed to move and therefore they generate good data, they're you know, informative data. On the other hand, the, these industrial plants are designed not to move. They're supposed to be stationary. They're supposed to operate uh, at steady state. And they're supposed to react only to uh, changes in set points or disturbances. Uh, so they are generating lots of data, big data, but it's not necessarily useful for building models. To me, from a theoretical perspective, it's not clear as to uh, how to define what is good data that I can use in order to build reliable models. Okay, so that's, I mean, I can talk about a variety of other challenges, but I think this is a really uh, a huge challenge in terms of using large volumes of industrial existing industrial data to build uh, machine learning uh, machine learning models right um, uh, so, so what, what sorry uh, michael what's the second question it's uh... oh yeah the the second question was was kind of the the cost to benefit uh, oh, yeah. ratio that that industry so, needs to to right. leverage right. these models you know even if we can achieve one or two percent improvement uh, in what they're doing because because of uh, uh, the margins at which they work and the amount of product they make, et cetera, uh, you're going to save them millions of dollars a year. So for instance, uh, the furnace example, um, you know, we, if, if we can predict those um, arc losses with 75% accuracy, five minutes in advance, uh, we will uh, save them millions of dollars a year very easily. Wow. Right? Okay. Because, um, yeah, so as I, as I mentioned, uh, at the rate at which they're losing those uh, arcs right now, they're losing roughly uh, one month production time, right? Uh, so, so you're looking at the, you know, that, that probably translates to 10% of their, uh, uh, their revenue, right? Um, we, are, we are not able to pr predict every arc loss. We are only able to predict about 75% of those arc losses, even if they can prevent 75% of those losses, uh, you know, they, they're making 7.5% um, uh, more profits, right? So yeah, so there, there's a lot of uh, uh, 
uh, money to save or make. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, McKinsey, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but McKinsey, um, at the consulting company, they released a white paper a few years ago where they argued that um, manufacturing and process industries are poised to save or make hundreds of billions of dollars by simply figuring out how to use existing data, by figuring out how to extract value from existing yep. data. Yep. So there's a lot of other uh, consulting companies that have done uh, research into this and they've all come to the same conclusion that uh, these industries can make hundreds of billions of dollars by figuring out how to use their data. Okay, great, thank you, thank you. Uh, let, let's uh, thank Bhushan, great. Sorry, the, the, the virtual clapping feels so lame, but, uh, but I, I, we are all clapping heartily. Um, okay, great. So let, let's move on to the, to the next presenter. Uh, so uh, Alina Robeva, uh, while she's getting setting up, let me, let me uh, uh, just do, do as best as I can for, uh, for an introduction. So she has her PhD in mathematics from uh, University of California, Berkeley. Uh, where, where her thesis uh, won the, the Bernard Friedman Memorial Prize in, in Applied Mathematics. Uh, she then worked for three years uh, as a statistics instructor and NSF uh, postdoctoral fellow uh, in the Department of Mathematics and Institute for Data Systems and Society at uh, MIT. Uh, then uh, we were fortunate enough to have her join us at UBC in 2019, where, where she is a, an assistant professor in the Department of Mathematics. Uh, she's won the, the UBC PIMS Mathematical Sciences uh, Young Faculty Award in 2020, and also a SIAM uh, AG Early Career Prize in, in 2019. Uh, and uh, her research lies at the intersection of uh, mathematical statistics, machine learning, combinatorics, multilinear algebra, and applied algebraic uh, geometry. So I'm greatly looking forward to, uh, to her lab uh, tour. Alina. Uh, great, thanks so much for the introduction and thanks for having me here today. So um, my research is very much on the theoretical side compared to, I guess, the other presentations today. Um, and it really revolves around estimation in models that are defined by algebraic constraints. So let me explain what I mean by that. So, oops, okay. So the main, um, uh, my research mainly studies statistical models that depict complex dependencies between random variables. Uh, and it turns out that oftentimes um, the reason that these models are, are hard is that they're nonlinear in nature. Okay, and so there's uh, three main topics that uh, you could try to split my research into. So the first one is uh, finding decompositions of tensors, matrices, or general signals, uh, as we'll see later. Um, I also study causality. So how do we learn um, causal relationships between random variables? Um, and uh, a lot of times there will be hidden variables or cycles. So uh, feedback loops um, and causality. So how do we um, learn the structure from data? And then um, there's other types of um, relationships between random variables um, that I study, for example, positive dependence. So sometimes variables that we observe are very highly positively dependent on each other. So um, in medical data here, I have some uh, an example of uh, stock market price data where stock market prices behave, um, go up and down together. And so these are very positively dependent. And if we uh, sort of assume that and we observe the data, we can um, then estimate their distribution more efficiently. All right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and as I was saying, a lot of these models are actually given by nonlinear algebraic constraints. So linear models have been widely studied um, in statistics and machine learning in the past. So for example, linear regression, principal component analysis, uh, even um, if, you, if you know about them, undirected Gaussian graphical models are sort of linear. Um, and then a lot of more complicated models that are highly useful across the sciences um, are nonlinear in nature. So as we'll see in a bit, uh, low rank tensor and matrix decomposition, um, general graphical models. So ones coming from causality or ones that are uh, undirected, um, but not necessarily Gaussian, they're also nonlinear. And then uh, all of these um, um, positively dependent models, uh, all of these are quite hard to study. And one of the main reasons is that they're nonlinear. All right, so uh, let me start by telling you a little bit about each of the topics uh, 
of my, of my research in a little bit more depth. So um, the first one is matrix and tensor decomposition. So here um, we observe a matrix and you might have heard of the famous Netflix prize problem where you have a matrix uh, which has, um, whose rows are indexed by users, columns are indexed by movies and um, the entries tell you what rating this given user gives to a given movie. And it turns out that, um, and it's very sparse, this matrix. We don't really know most of the ratings. We would like to fill it in. And it turns out that um, this matrix is actually very close to being low rank because um, you can decompose it into rank one terms depending on the preferences of the users. And um, for example, does this user like uh, horror movies and is this movie a horror movie? So you can rate how much it is a horror movie and how much this user prefers the ho uh, prefers horror movies. And then this would be one rank term and you can do you know, romance or cartoons or whatever you want. Um, and uh, you know, this is why this matrix is all rank. And so if you assume it is low rank, then um, you can much more easily fill it in because that restricts the possibilities of how you can fill it in. Um, and one of the issues is that uh, it, this decomposition should actually be non-negative and uh, finding a non-negative rank decomposition of a matrix is actually a hard problem. Finding a general decomposition, uh, not so much, but a non-negative one is pretty hard. And similarly, uh, tensor decompositions pop up in many uh, hidden variable problems. And uh, along the lines of the Netflix problem, there's the Groupon problem where you have not just users and activities, but you also have time of the year or the day or, or, or so on. Like for example, skiing would only be interesting in the winter and so on. And so, uh, but tensor decompositions show up in many other ways. So you can just um, take a, a, da a data tensor and show that for some reason it has to be low rank. Like there's a lot of applications in chemometrics and psychometrics, or you might have a um, hidden variable like in topic models. And then this tensor would then <clears throat> decompose into a few uh, low rank terms. And the issue with both non-negative matrix decomposition and tensor decomposition is that they are quite hard. So uh, one of the things that I study is what makes these problems so hard. Uh, and we've shown that there is very intrinsic um, geometric structure that um, uh, might be responsible for that. Um, <clears throat> and in addition, we study what additional structure you can place you can impose to make these problems easier. So maybe in the uh, worst case scenario, it's empty hard to decompose a tensor, but then if this tensor has special structure, it's actually possible to have an efficient algorithm. So we've been studying such, um, such, such types of structures. Another uh, topic that I've been very excited about recently is uh, learning causal models from observations. So these are quite applicable across the sciences. For example, here I have a gene regulatory network where you have genes at the vertices of a graph and then you put arrows from one gene to another if uh, changes in the expression of one cause changes in the expression of another. Uh, or here I have a disease diagnosis graph where you have uh, at the vertices you place um, different diseases, different symptoms and different environmental or behavioral factors. And then you try to connect uh, them if one causes another. And imagine con collecting uh, data from 1,000 patients, and then you try to, to reconstruct this graph. So how much uh, medicine they take, what's their blood pressure, do they have the disease or not, and so on. So the question is, uh, can we uh, recover the structure of these graphs from observations? And then uh, some additional harder questions then are, what, are, what if there are hidden variables or cycles? and what additional assumptions make learning these graphs easy? For example, assuming that they're linear in nature makes it easy. Um, for example, saying that um, this guy is a linear combination of everything that causes it will make learning these a little bit easier. Um, okay, um, another topic uh, that I'm very excited about is super resolution imaging, where we imagine we observe a picture of uh, the stars or uh, maybe a picture taken by a microscope. And um, as any imaging, as with any imaging device, every point source of light is going to be blurred. Uh, and on top of that, there will be low resolution. It won't be, you won't be able to observe um, infinitely close things. And so the question is, can we remove the blur from the imaging device and can we uh, enhance the resolution? And uh, there's a lot of different theoretical 
issues. And uh, in these uh, works, we show that um, the, the only thing that's, so in certain settings, the only thing that's responsible uh, for it being hard to learn is the noise. So if there were no noise, then you can learn them perfectly. But then, um, so, so this is sort of uh, an interesting um, observation that we make uh, in these two uh, papers. And then uh, finally, I've been very excited about non-parametric density estimation. So a lot of times when we try to infer, infer a density or infer something about the data, we assume that it's Gaussian or we assume that it behaves according to cert a certain um, parametric distribution. But um, that really restricts us because most likely the data is not Gaussian. And so we've been looking at different types of non-parametric restrictions that are much less restrictive than the parametric ones. So for example, these totally positive densities that I mentioned before, where you assume that the data, that the random variables are very highly positively dependent on each other. And it turns out that this is extremely um, likely to happen in, in stock market price data, in phylogenetics, uh, it comes up quite often. And also, and this uh, funny example of uh, uh, exam test score data, where you take the test scores of uh, different subjects of, of students, sorry, uh, of different questions on a test of students, and it turns out that they're all positively related to each other, because if you're if you answer one question correctly, you're most likely to answer the other questions correctly as well, because there's the hidden um, variable, which is how much you know the material, or something like this. So uh, a lot of this data, a lot of data in the real world actually behaves in this way. Um, and so we do non-parametric estimation under this condition. And there's other types of conditions like this. So for example, log concavity, that's also a generalization of Gaussian variables and um, also graphical models. So instead of assuming you have a Gaussian graphical model or discrete graphical model, we just assume that um, we have data that comes from a specific graphical model. Uh, and then we try to estimate the, the density. Okay, so these are sort of the things that I've been uh, working on the last few years. And um, here I have a few names, unfortunately no pictures of the group and this is only the people at UBC. So I've been here for two years and uh, I've really enjoyed working with undergrads and I'm, um, I've been, you know, now I have master's students, hopefully they'll turn to PhD students in the future. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of other people that I've collaborated in the past as well. All right, so that's all I had, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Alina. Yeah, we we do have the time for some questions. Uh, let, let me lead off by by just uh, yeah. Let, let me ask about about the causal models. And so, are are there any uh, additional assumptions that that you're using? Uh, it, uh, because uh, um, in order to take advantage, like uh, in order to just learn from observations and, and not actually uh, have any interventions, um, yeah. can, can you describe how that works? Yeah. So. Um... If you don't do interventions, um, most of the time you can't learn the actual graph. So let me just show some graphs. So uh, most of the time you can only learn the graph up to what's called a, an equi a Markov equivalence class. So uh, you can learn a set of graphs that are possible. So for example, you can't, uh, if you have just two variables, you can't tell if A causes B or if B causes A. But um, if you assume that the relationships are linear, so each variable is a linear combination of its parents um, plus some noise. Then, and if the noise is non-Gaussian, then you can actually learn the, the whole graph from observations. And uh, that's also true in the case of hidden variables. So you can just learn the graph. It's very interesting. And so the most, the simplest example again, A causes B or B causes A, you can, you can distinguish between those if you assume this linear relationship plus non-Gaussian noise. So that's, uh, yeah, so that's one of the, uh, I think, very interesting things that we've been working on lately. Yeah, okay, great. That, that's really interesting, especially about the, the non-Gaussian uh, 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 properties and, and what that gives you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, we have a, a question from Alexandre Bouchard-Côté. Uh, can you expand a bit on the phylogenetic example from the, from the non-parametric slide? Oh, yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, so this is, um, uh, so this total positive densities, they come in Brownian motion, uh, tree models. So if you're trying to measure, let's say, the length of a bone, uh, let's say, you know, your, you know this bone, uh, 
uh, in each of these species. Um, one of the ways to model this is using a Brownian motion tree model where you uh, sort of do a Brownian motion along the tree and then you, you split up and so on. And it turns out that the joint distribution at the leaves of the tree is going to be this totally positive. Um, maybe you've heard of the FKG inequality. So this is sort of what, what this totally positive is. Um, yeah. So this is how it comes up in phylogenetics. Okay, great, great. Okay, so uh, with that, we we're, we're, uh, should move on to the, uh, the, the next overview. So many thanks, greatly appreciated. Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, so our next speaker is, uh, is Mark Schmidt. And so um, let me just, uh, while Mark is setting up, let me just give a, a brief background, uh, a brief, brief introduction. So uh, Mark has his PhD from, from uh, UBC in, uh, from 2010. And since then he did, uh, uh, he did a number of postdocs, including at uh, uh, Ecole Normale Normal Supérieure in, uh, in INRIA, France, uh, or so, and also associated with, with an INRIA project. Um, and he further did postdoc work at, uh, in the Natural Language Lab at Simon Fraser University. Uh, since uh, 2014, he's uh, assistant professor at, uh, 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 sorry, but, uh, since 2014, he's, he's been professor at uh, UBC, where he's now, now associate professor of computer science. Um, and also, let, let me note, uh, importantly, he's uh, won uh, many interesting uh, and, and notable awards and fellowships, including a, uh, an Alfred uh, Sloan Research uh, Fellowship. Uh, he's a CIFAR Senior uh, Fellow and, a C and uh, currently a Canada CIFAR AI Chair affiliated with uh, AMI, the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. And he, uh, also, most notably, he in 2018 he was he, he won the uh, Lagrange Prize in Continuous uh, Optimization. And so, with that, uh, please take it away, Mark. All right, thank you, Michael. I hope that everybody can hear me and can see the screen. So uh, I'm Mark. Uh, my research mainly focuses on two things. So the first thing is um, the algorithms underlying machine learning. So uh, machine learning is often uh, phrased as solving some sort of optimization or integration or some sort of fixed point problem. So, you, so we work on trying to improve those algorithms. And so the problem is many off the shelf uh, problems, uh, algorithms for solving these problems don't really solve uh, scale to modern applications. And so we range from the full spectrum from proving theorems to doing experiments to releasing public code. Uh, the second part of my research is on applications of ML. So I think that, that machine learning is a transformative tool that can help many fields. And so this doesn't really have a theme. We just sort of try and find important or interesting applications of machine learning and try to make progress on those problems. Over here is my set of uh, students, or at least as of summer last year, uh, when we switched to Zooming. Okay, so I'm just going to give some examples of um, some projects from both of those types of themes in my research. So the first is a method for uh, abnormality detection in x-rays. So you go and get an x-ray and then there's a, there's a tool that was really built by one qubit uh, that I was just consulting for and it, and it tells you if there's parts of the x-ray that don't look uh, normal. Uh, so this is training hundreds of thousands of images, and we are definitely not the first people to do this. It seems like everyone, their dog, has an x-ray classification system these days, uh, and with COVID, that's become even more popular. The, the difference in our work is we did a clinical trial sort of evaluating system in the wild. So we don't claim we have the most accurate system, but we did actually try it out, had a whole bunch of different type of doctors actually use this in their clinical practice. And we found that, that it, can, it can reduce errors uh, in some cases quite dramatically for some types of doctors. So this was the first AI tool or AI assistant tool for radiology to be certified as a medical device by Health Canada. That's gonna be uh, deployed across Canada possibly later this year. So that, that's a very exciting thing uh, for the field, I think. Uh, here's another example. So uh, the, the goal here was to just count objects in images. So you're given an image, in this case, it's a commercial fishing link, lake, and you want to count saying that there's, there's three people fishing on this lake based on the image. Uh, and so this, this was a project that the BC Freshwater Fisheries, a nonprofit, came to us with. 
Uh, and they had many years of data where they just uh, sort of uh, people clicked on the these faraway people in uh, images, and then they wanted to build a system that automatically counts. So the advantage of taking a machine learning approach to that is we not only developed uh, a very nice system for that application, but actually we developed a general method that can solve all sorts of counting problems. So we got state of the art in terms of counting penguins in Antarctica or counting cars on a highway or number of pedestrians at a crosswalk or, or, or number of products in your store, whatever. And this is really the key advantage of taking like a core machine learning approach is we can hopefully, instead of just solving one problem, we can maybe solve that problem but develop a method that can apply to many different problems and help many different applications. I just wanna mention a third example because this is very recent. So uh, this was in collaboration with Artona, which is the, the company that uh, takes your grad photos when you graduate at UBC or other, or your high school in BC or whatever. Uh, and so this project was just doing the face retouching. So you would learn to take an input image and then you clean it up. So you remove pimples, blemishes, stray hairs, small amounts of wrinkles and so on, but you don't really wanna change the things that make you you. So you, you still want it to look like you. And so, you know, the goal is to improve like high school kids self-esteem and so on and not have a picture in your parents' basement that looks terrible for 20 years afterwards. Uh, so this was trained on professional artists but actually the system outperforms professional artists based on a user study. Um, so my student and, and with, with one of the people at Artona have founded a new company in Vancouver. So contributing to the local economy. Uh, and, the, and this product is already being used by photography studios around the world. It's already processed over 1 million commercial images. Okay, and uh, so there should be an app coming out at some point in time because it also works on smartphone photos. So you take your selfie on your smartphone and then it can sort of uh, instantly remove, sort of clean some stuff up that you may not really like in the picture, but not like airbrush you or make you look like someone else or, or make you look like a cartoon or something like that. Okay, so those are just examples of applications. I'm always interested in learning about new applications uh, because I think machine learning is just a tool that can really help you do amazing things in many different settings. The core part of my research is really on the algorithms for machine learning. And so I just wanna mention some um, algorithm advances we've made in the last few years. So the first is for, for what's called overparameterization. So this has been a, a really wild trend in machine learning where people are using models that are so complicated that you can, you can actually fit every data point exactly. So think like these deep neural networks, these convolutional networks, these, these language models and so on. They're so complicated that if you ran the, the training long enough, you would eventually fit the data exactly. So one question you might ask is how does this affect a learning algorithm? Uh, and so there's some old results, uh, originally from the 90s during the last wave of popularity of deep learning, basically showing that SGD uh, works better. Uh, and so, so something that uh, was actually known already almost 10 years ago is, is if you just run your stochastic gradient, the standard neural network training algorithm, and you don't, you just make a constant step size, you, it'll actually converge faster for this type of problem than it would for a normal problem. And so we've given a whole bunch of new results uh, related to this idea of overparameterization. So one is uh, we have a way to actually adaptively set the learning rate as you go. So if, you're, if your learning is happening too quickly, it'll slow you down so that you're not doing, doing wild things. If your learning is happening too slowly, it'll actually speed you up so that you're not, so that you're going as fast as you could be. And we actually proved that this is as best as the fast fixed rate. Uh, and in practice, this, this new method, that's the test error on a standard data set, sort of dramatically uh, improves over other methods in many settings. Uh, we gave some really nice things. If you know what an accelerated or a second order method is in optimization, uh, you probably can't do that in the normal stochastic gradient setting, but under this overparameterization setting, you can. And there's also some things like regret that, that have been shown. Um, here's another like very, very fundamental contribution. So most machine learning uh, applications, you ultimately fit the model with sometimes call, something called gradient descent. And we know the gradient descent is very fast for something called the strongly convex function. But uh, even like the simplest models in machine learning don't actually satisfy that assumption. So the linear least squares model that you maybe learned about in high school or in your first stats class or something like that is not strongly convex if you have what's called collinearity. 
So people have basically spent like 25 years trying to fix this. So there's all these different relaxations trying to fix that issue. Um, and so we also put our hat into that game and we rediscovered something called uh, the PL inequality. So it's Pol Poliak Wojasiewicz, it looks like that. So this gives you very simple proof that, that this gradient descent method is gonna converge very fast uh, for, for many of the standard problems like least squares. This condition is weaker than the conditions from the past 25 years. And originally it actually came from a paper in Russian in 1963. So that, that, was, that was where this came from is this was uh, the Russian guy who wrote it. And this was a, a French guy who, or, or a paper published in French in the same year. Um, so basically we use this to simplify uh, the analysis of all the standard algorithms. So stochastic gradient, coordinate uh, descent, all sorts of things. And so this gave us a bunch of new insights and new rates on all the sort of standard problems like least squares and boosting and SVMs and L1 regularization, back propagation, whatever. And, and recently people, other people have combined this work and the previous work I've mentioned together and shown that this is like a sensible thing for many neural networks too. So the last thing I'll mention is, is a paper that I'm, I'm very recently excited about. It's related to something called the expectation maximization or the EM algorithm. So this is the most common algorithm for handling missing data. It's among the top 100 most cited papers of all time across all fields. So it has more than 60,000 citations. And usually people, whether they know it or not, they're using it for something called an exponential family distribution. Uh, but unfortunately we have massive gaps in this theory. And in particular, if you start, if you don't start it really close to the solution, we really don't know uh, what this algorithm, how this algorithm works. So there are a bunch of previous results. So it's been known since the 70s that if you start close to the solution, the speed of this algorithm depends on the amount of missing information you have. Uh, but if you're far from the solution, all we really know is that this is at least as fast as gradient descent. But in practice, the EM algorithm actually converges much faster than gradient descent. Uh, and the, the, when people show that EM is at least as fast as gradient descent, they usually do it under assumptions that are not true. So they show some sort, sort of result like this that looks very fancy or whatever. But if you look closely, uh, you find that L is infinity for almost every practical problem. And so this inequality is completely meaningless. Um, and then of course, those new results, I don't see the amount of missing information there. So something is wrong. So just in the last year, we've given new results for this common case called exponential families by showing EM as a form of mirror descent in that case. And in this, you get new results that look like this. Uh, obviously, I don't have time to go through them, but the point is there's no L there. And so what that means is, first off, there's no infinity there, but second off, it's actually not problem dependent. So it's what's called homeomorphic invariant. It doesn't matter how you parameterize the problem, the algorithm converges at the same speed. Uh, and this really holds under minimal assumptions. You don't have to make unrealistic assumptions. So this is kind of neat. It's related to like the gradient in some way. It's related to natural gradient. So you, it's, it's like you're showing progress in what's called the natural gradient instead of the normal gradient. Uh, and this, we, we found out just last month that this won the best paper prize. So out of uh, around 1500 papers submitted to AI stat chosen as the, um, as the best paper prize. So we were very uh, excited about that. All right, thank you for uh, listening and I'll, I'll stop my, uh, my list there. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Mark. And, and congratulations on that best paper prize. That, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, we do have time for, for one question. Um, so please post in the chat and or just open up your mic. I'll pause for a second. And uh, otherwise I'll, I do have a question of my own lined up, but uh, let, let me just ask, uh, is, is there a good story behind the connections to, to, to the Russian literature? So most of us already have enough problems keeping up with the existing flood of literature related to AI and machine learning. And, and here you are now we all have to, uh, we should all uh, dig carefully through the Russian literature. There, there must be a story there. Yeah, I mean, so this, it is interesting story in optimization. So. Um, because there, was, there wasn't as much communication as there could have been in like the 60s and 70s and so on, the Russian and, and the sort of North American Western church kind of looked at different things when they were analyzing algorithms. So 
Uh, for numerical algorithms in the Western world, it was all about finding out what happens close to the solution. What happens if you run it long enough and you eventually get close to the solution and under very strong assumptions like strong smoothness and, and things like that. And the Russian literature kind of took the opposite approach. It says, well, what happens when you're far from the solution? I, I'm only gonna run this album for a finite amount of time. I don't care about limits. What happens when I run it for 10 iterations? And it also looked at really weakening the assumption saying, well, what if I'm looking at a non-differentiable problem? What if, I'm, what if I'm looking at a problem where I have something stochastic or something like that? And so it turns out in modern applications where we're always limited by time, the literature is sort of winning out. And, and, and so people are rediscovering a lot of results and those Russian mathematicians are becoming stars. And so it's funny, the, the paper that we're citing is from 1963, but we got, actually got a Polyak a few days later, the guy who wrote the paper in 1963 saying like, thank you for, uh, for highlighting this work. I don't know why people didn't appreciate it more at the time. <laughs> That's fascinating. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. And, and also to hear about the yeah the, the different uh, families of assumptions that that get used and, and how they change over time. Um, great. Th thank you. So we, we we do have to move on, but but let's uh, let's give a, a round of applause to to Mark. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Much appreciated. Okay. So our, our next speaker is is Parang Abdul Mesemi. And so uh, while he's setting up, let me. Uh, let me just give a brief introduction. So he has his uh, PhD from UBC in uh, 2002. Uh, from 2002 to uh, 2009, he was faculty at the, the School of Computing at uh, Queen's University. And 2009, he came back to UBC now as a now as a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, where he holds a, a tier two uh, Canada Research Chair in Biomedical Engineering. And he also has affiliations with the Department of uh, Ur Urological Sciences. Uh, he's a recipient of the Killam Faculty Research Prize. And he, uh, importantly, he plays a, a leading role in, uh, in running uh, and, and, uh, and establishing UBC's Biomedical Imaging and, and Artificial Intelligence uh, Research Cluster, uh, which is uh, working on, uh, as I'm sure we'll hear more about, uh, developing a deeper understanding of uh, molecular, cellular, and tissue structure and organization related to uh, normal and disease tissue function uh, to enable personalized medicine. Uh, so uh, welcome, Parang. Thank you so much. Uh, I mean, I want to thank all the organizers uh, who put this event together. Fantastic talks also by all the speakers before me. It's very big shoes to fill. Um, so I want to, I guess, give an introduction of our, on our um, uh, lab. Uh, which is the robotics and co control lab. Um, uh, and uh, the lab is focused across many different verticals. Uh, centrally uh, has been around uh, robotics. We have a few Da Vinci systems and also an imaging where uh, we have been fortunate enough to equip, be able to equip our lab with now, I think about 15 ultrasound systems. And we have also partners from across the city, uh, BC Women's Hospital, BC Children, BC Cancer Agency, uh, Process Center, and uh, <clears throat> also many also the departments across uh, the Vancouver Coastal Health. Um, and also, uh, we have been also fortunate to have a fantastic group of students, uh, which uh, some, is somewhere between 30 to 40 students, who have been helping us making uh, this work happen. And the work I'm presenting today is really the result of the collective work of this group. Um, some of the key uh, kind of recent, I guess, uh, innovations of the group include uh, the Sonic Insight by Tim and Rob. Uh, it's a FDA approved product, which uh, they measure the quantitative properties of the mechanical properties of the liver and I guess for some of you like myself who have been fortunate enough to be able to drink a lot of beer during the pandemic, it's a fantastic tool put an order through to measure your health. And uh, also the work that the uh, team did uh, with the BC Cancer Agency uh, in uh, planning the uh, radiation therapy procedures for prostate cancer treatment, which is now a standard of care in BC with more than 4,000 patients benefited from this work. Um, today, I want to focus on uh, one of our uh, pillars, which is uh, on AI and on, on echocardiography specifically. Um, and uh, cardiac imaging is really fascinating. I mean, it's a, uh, obviously heart is a, is, a, is a moving 
object and uh, it's very um, uh, difficult to image and you can see the images of the ultrasound of the heart are also fairly uh, noisy and uh, um, the objective of a echocardiographer or cardiologist in this case is to be able to capture the right uh, intersection of your heart to be able to measure, for example, some of the key parameters of your, uh, for example, in this case, the left ventricle. And if you do it properly, obviously you can make a, make a measurement right and get the right uh, kind of lengths, for example, of the left ventricle. But if you actually cut it in a, in a right or in a wrong orientation, you end up basically interpreting your anatomy in a wrong way and give a wrong prescription to the patient and actually you can cause harm. So back in 2013, I had a call from uh, Dr. Teresa Sang, who is the director of echocardiography at BGH and Vancouver General um, and, uh, uh, and, and at UBC, who basically posed a challenging question to me um, where uh, she was, while they see uh, a number of patients uh, uh, going through their clinical center uh, with their advanced uh, ultrasound systems and the CART-based systems uh, who are being examined by experts. She's seeing, she was seeing more and more uh, physicians who are using these portable ultrasound devices and, and capturing data and sending to her uh, for interpretation. And because those users were non-expert, she had to basically call in the patient. The patient had to go to the wait time, which could be up to three to six months. And this was really causing a major backlog and issue in patient management at, at BGH. So we put a team together uh, with Rob and, uh, and Teresa and, and, and the cardiology fellows and our, and our, our graduate student uh, team. And uh, we went after funding and also we approached the Vancouver Coastal and the privacy group uh, to, uh, to ask for very large amount of data. Uh, that was kind of the fairly early days of what we call today as deep learning and, and AI. And uh, um, we got a blanket approval to access more than 10 years of Vancouver data, which was at the time about 100,000 records and now it's, I think it's more than 200,000 records. And uh, this included clinical charts, all the measurements, uh, videos, uh, you're basically talking about petabytes of data. And uh, uh, the objective really was to figure out solutions where we could uh, make um, uh, ultrasound acquisition uh, uh, with uh, quality assurance. So we prototyped a few apps. Uh, these are some of the apps we built at the time where, for example, you could use deep learning as the data are coming in and the sonographer are acquiring the data and we could automatically estimate how far the acquisition plane is from the uh, cardi expert cardiologist acquisition. And we could also do analytics, for example, on those videos where as, as the data were coming in, uh, we could actually estimate some of the key parameters, real-time segmentation and some of the key uh, clinical parameters from the echocardiography data. And then the challenge was, how, what do we do next? And really we posed a very audacious uh, goal of how uh, to be able to deploy this technology to the community. And you can actually, just a fun fact that I didn't know, uh, like Northern Health, just Northern Health in BC, which is around 300,000 uh, people, uh, it's actually the size of France, which is two orders of magnitude more populated. So it, in BC, we have actually unique also situation of a fairly sparse distribution of, of the clinical expertise. And really the main thing was how, how AI can actually help and facilitate kind of a quality assurance across our uh, community for also improved patient care. So uh, we approached the uh, Canada Digital Supercluster Technology and uh, Sam Pauls and a few industry partners. And we put a team together with Dr. Orm Frankler and at, at Sam Pauls, who is a emergency medicine doctor. And uh, we got uh, about $2 million funding to uh, distribute around 80 transducers across the province. Um, uh, and uh, interestingly, what happened with COVID was that the timeline of the deployment that was supposed to be around uh, one and a half years deployment, it got shrunk to about three months. 
and because they give us another half a million. And basically, we this is a live map of where these transcript these transducers are distributed across the province. A lot of them uh, actually are or to some uh, some of the physicians even that cover the First Nations communities. And uh, the current estimate of the network capacity is about covering about 60,000 patients uh, and using a cloud uh, system uh, with uh, privacy settings. We are interconnecting a lot of physicians. Data are coming live uh, to the cloud and then goes to our lab and then gets labeled. And we're basically have this live uh, ecosystem that we are building AI and then uh, evaluating it in real time uh, using the data from across the community. Uh, the project currently covers not only cardiac imaging, but also obstetrics and also uh, lung imaging for COVID assessment. And we're getting fantastic feedback from the rural physicians in terms of the impact it has had on the lives of many patients. Um, obviously this project got a lot of uh, media coverage um, and uh, also got recognized by Supercluster as one of their uh, kind of main impact projects. And then it was featured by our uh, Minister of Innovation in January as a transformational project that's writing history. And interestingly, also it contributed partly to what we saw in the budget 2021 where uh, the federal government highlighted kind of projects that use AI and digital technologies to help facilitate faster and more accurate diagnosis of COVID. And thankfully also it uh, kind of, uh, uh, to some extent contributed to the $60 million uh, that the government uh, contributed to, I guess, the continuation of the supercluster program, which has been a fantastic initiative for BC. Um, some of the challenges, I guess, that I want to highlight that we are dealing with, and I want all of the, help that you guys as experts in AI and uh, fundamental AI can give us are that really data are very valuable, uh, valuable. The clinical data have significant challenges in terms of handling quality, same anatomy can appear in very different kind of uh, uh, quality with different systems uh, and image settings. Uh, you also have a situation where data are, where labels are very sparse, physicians, in a video of let's say 100 frames, physicians only label maybe one, one uh, frame where they would give you kind of their assessment of a measurement. And then the question is how can you learn from one frame and then be able to extrapolate to the entire video? And uh, as this is some of the kind of the recent advancements we've had in terms of using, for example, automatic est estimation of the uncertainty, to be able to uh, handle uh, situations like this where you kind of automatically determine which frames of the video are most reliable to be able to make clinical predictions. Um, and we are also extending it to obstetrics. For example, this is a, um, a, a model which is automatically, for example, estimating that in a, in a view of a, of a first trimester pregnancy, there is, for example, some measurements that need to be made as well as some anatomy that are present. We're taking it one step further um, uh, in, in, in moving from detection to prediction. So we have a project uh, with Population Data BC where we are using longitudinal data of across all of our province over the past 20 years and all of the data in terms of hospitalization and, and medication to be able to uh, interlink images and, and electronic health records and be able to predict based on an image observation what would be an instant of an event. For example, in the first tackle that we are going for is the ischemic stroke. Um, there are tons of challenges uh, as highlighted by my previous speakers and we really need help. So anybody who is interested, we are very interested in any of the topics that I've listed and many more. And uh, um, uh, I want to say that none of this would have happened without the partners, the students, and also uh, 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 a bit of luck, and I guess the timing that, uh, that we had in this project. And also finally, I also want to um, kind of thank all the sponsors who put this uh, project, uh, I guess, uh, together and also Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies uh, that 
uh, enabled me for the past year to work with a group of amazing scholars and, and also some artists. For example, the image on the right shows uh, kind of the perspective of an artist for what we are doing in the province, where a lot of people putting their data together uh, to build basically a common nest where all of us will benefit from. So by this, we, I end the talk. Okay, great. Uh, many thanks, Parang, and, and congratulations uh, for, for leading uh, research projects that, that are having this kind of immediate impact. That's, uh, that's amazing. I uh, have time for a question if uh, anyone wants to open their mic or um, let me check the uh, participants here. Um, all right. Um, let me ask, like, so, so, to what extent are you uh, currently data bound? So, if if you if you were able to to double the number of of labeled or partially labeled data sets that you work with, um, how much how much benefit would would that provide? Or uh, you know, or are the next steps uh, uh, do the next steps lie elsewhere? Um, it depends on the type of the problem that that we tackle. Some of the problems we have seen that as we increase the size of data, we increase the number of specifically the long tail part of the data. For example, you have rare pathologies that uh, you have to handle and for which in a small sample size, you don't have enough samples to learn from. So those cases, you actually benefit a lot from a large amount of data. But the other side of the challenge is that it doesn't matter sometimes how much data you have, if the variability in your clinical labels is like 30, 40%, <laughs> then you have a secondary problem that how would you do quality assurance on the labels uh, and, uh, and, and, and learn really sometimes because you can't really get an expert relabel everything. Yeah, so uh, it is, a, it is a, it become an exponentially more difficult problem, yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay. Oh, I see a question here. Uh, since a uh, question from, from J1 Jang, um, since wrong predictions and estimations in the medical field is a critical issue, how does the challenge uh, look like in terms of handling and yeah, how do you deal with that issue? This is a fantastic question. And, and this is something we are struggling with. <laughs> so currently, uh, for example, in some of the work that we are working with the companies in this consortium, uh, we are putting very strict bounds on the output of the network. So we are trying to basically be very conservative and, and put a lot of thresholds on the, on the model output along with any other cue we have from the, from the videos that the model does not output anything for which we think it's gonna predict wrong. Um, obviously that means that in a practical sense, there will be many situations that the operator is acquiring data and the model is not outputting anything. But we just wanna make sure that when we are outputting, it is correct. And uh, this is one of the fragilities of the AI today, which there is no guarantee in performance. And I cannot say it specifications of a performance in the output and make sure that those specifications are are, are followed when the model is outputting something. And, and, and anybody who has any solution for this, I would love to hear from you. Okay, great. That, that's a fantastic point to, to wrap up on. So, so many thanks again, Parang. That was uh, really, really amazing uh, results that, uh, that you're, you're working on. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll move on to uh, Alexandre Bouchard-Côté. So, uh, so uh, Dr. Alexandre Bouchard-Côté is an associate professor of statistics. And so he works on uh, computational statistics and uh, specifically the mathematical side uh, uh, and, um, as well as connections to linguistics and biology. He has a his PhD is from uh, the University of California, Berkeley, uh, where he worked with, uh, with Michael Jordan and uh, Dan Klein. And uh, yeah, he's, he's since then uh, received been the recipient of numerous awards, including the, the Tweedy Award, uh, Google Faculty Award, and uh, Martha Piper Awards. Uh, so we're, we're delighted to, to have you uh, today, Alexandre, and uh, please take it away. Thanks for the introduction, and thank you for organizing that, that great event. Uh, I really enjoyed the, the talk so far. Um, so unless there's any problem hearing me, I'll, uh, I'll get started. Um, so to, uh, to explain what I mean by Bayesian data science, let, let me just start by to contextualize uh, 
uh, to explain or review what is uh, calibration of measures of uncertainty. Um, so this is uh, something you probably ask yourself. So if the, the weather network gives 80% of rain for tomorrow, what is the actual fraction of time that there will be rain the day after? And if you look at sort of local TV networks, uh, it will actually be lower than that. So maybe it's some sort of psychologic manipulation. Whereas if you look at the weather channel, it will be basically on, uh, on par at the, the predicted level. So this means that the terminology that the local meteorologist is not calibrated, whereas the uncertainty estimate from National Weather Service is uh, calibrated. So for statistician, uh, calibration of measures of uncertainty is, is quite important. So it's one of the, the core values of the field in a sense. And classical methods to, to approach this question of calibrated uncertainty uh, usually proceed by assuming that we're estimating a vector in uh, RD. And uh, this is quite uh, useful to assume because vectors give us ve normal approximations uh, combined with other uh, assumptions. And that's the, the classical ways to, uh, to get calibrated uncertainty. Um, one thing my group has been quite interested uh, in the, the past decade is to go beyond vectors. So there are many things that are not vectors. Um, uh, networks, phylogenetic trees, uh, uh, molecules, and sometimes they can be coerced into vectors, but often they, by doing so, we'll, we will lose asymptotic normality and the, the sort of tools that allows us to, um, to quantify uh, uncertainty in a calibrated fashion. And so this is, in my view, one of the, the key motivation for Bayesian data science. So to obtain calibration, calibrated uncertainty beyond vectors. So for things like trees, for example, what I'm showing you here is a, a set of trees that, uh, is, uh, that, that represent what is the uncertainty over the phylogenetic tree. So the, the branching order of, uh, of uh, primate species in this example here. And the, the very interesting thing that sort of uh, sets Bayesian methods apart is that Bayesian credible sets are calibrated over arbitrary space, not just vectors. So it could be over trees or, or uh, networks, things like this. It, it does have an important uh, catch though. It has its, this, this property holds when the model is well specified, okay? So this sort of puts in context, what are the, the, the two main uh, research uh, foci, uh, foci in, in, in my group. Uh, so one of them is um, scalable Bayesian inference methods that work beyond vectors. So uh, phylogenetic inference, for example, Bayesian phylogenetic inference, or inference over matchings or um, combinatorial space in general, associated with uh, measures of uncertainty. And uh, the second research focus is to, to build tools so that we can uh, build good models. So uh, approximately well-specified models, again, not only for vectors, but for, for things that are combinatorial in nature or, or stochastic processes. Um, so uh, to give you some highlights, so in terms of scalable Bayesian inference, uh, let me start with an old idea. So Markov chain Monte Carlo. So this is um, the, the pro of this, this class of method is that it can be done over arbitrary spaces. Uh, the con is that popular methods tend to be slow. And so uh, with MCMC, unlike, unlike optimization, we're gonna use the whole path uh, formed by this random walk because that's the basis for uh, uncertain the estimation. So the way you perform this, this walk is constrained. Uh, that's constrained so that the uncertainty is calibrated. And uh, let's think about these constraints in a sort of way that the, the, the define sets of algorithms, if you will. Uh, the, the main recipe that we know that, that uh, for these random walks is the metropolis Hastings rules. And that's an example of what's called a reversible algorithm which if the space is discrete would have order n square constraints. So it's a, a small set of algorithms. 
So one thing that we've been very interested in my group recently is uh, this larger set called non-reversible algorithms and the discrete sets, it, uh, discrete settings that order n constraints instead of order n squares. So it's a bit much bigger space of algorithms. And the other interesting bit is that it's, it's sufficient uh, to get calibrated procedure. So the big question is basically if they are probably and practically superior algorithms in here, okay? And that's the, the, our, our, my research group has been at the, the, the forefront of this investigation. And the answer is yes. So there, there are practical methods that and with, associated with proofs that, that can outperform old methods. So here's some of my uh, UBC collaborators. So uh, Saf, Vittorio, Evan, and, and Trevor. And um, we've, we've shown several classes of algorithms that achieve this, these speedups. These speed uh, one thing that, that is uh, of interest uh, is also when we use non-reversible deep to traverse uh, a, a continuum of distribution. So it's a powerful idea in, in computational statistics where we, we look at not only one uh, distribution, the posterior distribution, but a whole continuum of distribution that interpolates between a, a prior distribution, which we can sample from, and a posterior distribution. And here, rever non-reversible algorithm really shine by sort of propagating information quickly between these two distributions. So it's just a sketch of related algorithm, a, a, a parallel tempering algorithm in this case in the reversible mode versus the non-reversible mode. And uh, a current direction that Trevor will talk a bit more later is also uh, how to optimize this continuum to make these round trips even faster. Um, in terms of theory, uh, I would say my key motivation is uh, software correctness. So uh, how can we use the theory in the MCMC setting to ensure that the code that we have actually computing the right thing? I think that's a, a question that's un underappreciated in the literature. And uh, we've been looking at uh, two key directions in this space. So geometric ergodicity of non-reversible processes and what I call not some kind of weird non-standard asymptotics where uh, instead of letting the number of iteration or the number of data point going to infinity, we let the, end, the number of cores, the parallelized resource going to infinity. Um, in terms of so, some recent users of our non-reversible methodology, so some highlights from this year. So the, you may have seen in the, in the news, this new high resolution image of the, the M87 black hole uh, so this this was actually uh, uh, using our as our methods as as part of the their computational pipeline where it was instrumental to do this this higher resolution uh, picture. Another recent highlight is that that it's our system or our algorithms have been used to uh, to do plasma reconstruction problems in in experimental fusion reactors. So this is being deployed in some. Uh, big science uh, experiments and, and uh, collaborations. Uh, so briefly on the, the second uh, research uh, focus, um, uh, we also work on, on building tools to, uh, to have a well-specified model or approximately well-specified model beyond vectors. Um, and so, one big stream there is uh, using stochastic processes to build these models. And so stochastic processes are infinite dimensional uh, random objects. And the, the big question there is how to do calculations over infinite dimensional objects. So we have several projects, some of them on, on jump processes where the time is continuous, but the space is discrete. So Miguel and, and Vincent are working on some project on this. And on uh, cases where both time and, and space are, are, dis, are continuous, so uh, diffusions where Sorab is doing a uh, very cool application and, and methodological work uh, in, this, in this space. Uh, often to do inference over these stochastic processes, we end up turning them into combinatorial objects. So, uh, which are also interesting by themselves. So how to design inference methods that are scalable over over these combinatorial spaces is another big theme. Uh, so we've done a lot of work on phylogenetic trees, in particular, uh, cancer cell phylogenetic trees. So Sierra, Kevin, for example, and Sora have been working on some very cool data in this space. 
uh, network model. So Korea has been working on this and uh, partition. Uh, uh, Sean has been working on some uh, partition that arise from um, Bayesian non-parametric models. And sort of uh, lessons that, we, that we've learned from doing all this helped us build uh, a, a scalable process programming language that, that shines for inference over combinatorial spaces. Uh, so uh, here it's, it's a, a PPL that uses inference method based on the continuum of distribution and non-reversible methods to gain uh, parallelization and, and scalability. And so Kevin, Matthew, and, and Giorgio, for example, have been working on this. And uh, this, this also yields accurate base factor estimates, which are quite useful for model selection. And so I invite you to, to check it out if, you, if, you, if you're interested to, to know more about it. Um, some, to conclude some brief uh, application highlights. So this is a long-term collaboration with uh, the BC Cancer and, and MSK with the Aparishu and Shaw Lab. So in terms of software, we have several widely used cancer bioinformatics tools that are grounded in stochastic process models. So uh, uh, PyClone, for example, is used quite widely and we have new tools for single cell methods that, that are uh, picking up quickly. In science that has been used, for example, to identify two distinct modes of uh, tumor spread in high-grade serous ovarian cancer. So uh, we actually use this to, to, to do scientific discovery. And we have several ongoing uh, projects uh, on CRISPR-Cas9 and single cell methods to track the evolutionary dynamics of cancer. So that's funded by a CFI and uh, a Terry Fox Foundation grant. So I'll end here and uh, thank you again for, for the opportunity to, uh, to present here. Okay, many thanks, uh, Alexandre. That was, uh, that was fascinating. And uh, yeah, in particular, it's, it's just uh, really great to see that uh, all of the, yeah, all of the folks like yourself, just with very strong uh, on the, uh, with looking in great depth at, at the, at new forms of, uh, New, the new the theoretical advances uh, are also uh, are also actually participating in, in great breadth as well in, in terms of uh, using these methods. Um, let me uh, let me see if there's any questions. I don't see any posted right now. Let, let me first ask, like, uh, yeah, the the non the non reversibility uh, work is 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 really very interesting to me. I, I guess in, in part because. So is, is one of the key benefits there just the, just the, the parallelism that applies and so you just to achieve uh, much faster sampling and, and inference as compared to reversible methods or, or, is, or, is, or am I going in the wrong direction there? So the, the non-reversibility by itself might not necessarily help for parallelism. It's more the, the, the continuum of distribution aspect of it that, that looking at several problems at the same time that um, and that that uh, that sort of give the fundamental parallelism, and what what the non-reversible give us is this sort of uh, breaking this conundrum that was in the literature that uh, it used to be that as you add more of these uh, distribution that interpolate between prior and posterior, you would actually first help performance and then eventually. Uh, be uh, basically harm the performance of the algorithm because of the diffusive behavior. So non reversibility allows us to, to basically uh, allow as much discretization as we want between the, the easy problem and the hard problem and, uh, to, 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 and sort of as a, as a corollary, exploit more parallel architectures. Got it, got it. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, let's see, anyone have a, let's see, you know, one more call for questions. Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, I'll ask one more about the about the language models. And so, so how important do you feel it is to to with the uh, with the that the language model that you're introducing in terms of uh, how has that changed how you interact with with different groups? Does it does it uh, help that you can provide a yeah? Does it presumably it helps in making these models much more accessible to, for different people to use, or um, or, or is it mainly uh, as as a unifying framework for for work within within your own group? Or yeah, can you 
comment on, on how this yeah this yeah so the, the prosty programming language yes for for the applied bayesian it's quite a it's a, a game changer because basically you the you can prototype models in like a few hours that would like literally take a full phd thesis perhaps and like not that long ago so it's uh it's yeah it's, it, some of these projects they i don't think they would be possible without these tools that uh to quickly iterate i can like i would not have time to do data analysis otherwise but i do i can actually get my hands dirty and and try some models on on uh, large cancer data and and so it's quite exciting to to try these more quickly and you do more formal model selection there's all sorts of tools to do uh new things that that would not be possible or would oh. Yeah. Different. Okay. And, and 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 so so this has already been de deployed for a number of the projects that that you spoke about. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Fantastic. So it's part of uh, two single cell pipelines. So one for for CRISPR and one for uh, for wow. constructing phylogenetic tree over uh, over a thousand cell at the time. And the total data set wow. has more than a million cells now. So it's been ran on Azure on on quite a bit of uh, uh, many data sets. So it's final round of uh of uh review in nature so fingers crossed that this will this will soon be uh, be out in the world wow okay fantastic fantastic okay so so that, that sounds like a great point to wrap up so 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 best of wishes uh, with that and uh th thank you so much for for joining us today Re so really appreciate it uh so that takes us to our last speaker for today and so uh this is uh mariam uh Kamgarpur. and so uh she uh, grew up in vancouver has her uh PhD in engineering from the University of, of California, Berkeley. Uh, we were fortunate enough to, to welcome her back uh, to join UBC and, and where she is now an assistant professor in the Department of uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering. Uh, she's a recipient of, uh, of numerous awards, uh, inter including the, the NASA High Potential Individual Award, uh, NASA Excellence in Publication Award, and also uh, she won a, a European Union uh, ERC starting grant uh, yeah, she works on uh, multiple agent decision making in uncertain and dynamic environments. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll be hearing more about this, but more specifically, uh, safe optimization and learning, uh, learning equilibrium in games, bandit problems, uh, and more. Uh, so with that, uh, we, we welcome you, um, Mariam, and uh, take it away. Okay, great. Thanks uh, for the introduction and hello, everyone. Uh, Thanks for your time for being here. And I'm just going to briefly present an overview of my research. Um, so my area, my background is on control theory, which is decision-making in environments that change. In other words, they're dynamic and are uncertain. And if we look at the evolution of these systems, we see that we're going from control of like a single agent in fairly predictable environments, such as like a generator to a network of systems, for example, a uh, um, renewable energy network with lots of uncertainty where we have uncertain output of renewables. Um, and we have a more challenging task of controlling this system. And from single aircraft or car control to an intelligent transportation network, and also from robots that work in fairly predictable environments to robots that um, go in unexplored environments and help us with dangerous tasks. And so what are uh, some of the challenges to address autonomy, increased autonomy is to manage these increased uncertainties, um, in particular ensuring system safety and coordinating the interactions of these network systems. So uh, my work overall is on developing fundamental um, understanding of decision making on, under uncertainty and design algorithms with provable safety and performance guarantees. And I'll briefly um, talk about uh, two aspects of these. Uh, one is safe control and learning under uncertainty, and also the other one is multi agent system learning and coordination. Okay, so first I start with the safe control. And I start with a background on one of the sort of early problems on work I worked on, which is air traffic control. So here, our dynamical system is the aircraft and it X is the state, so position, velocity, heading angle, and U is the input, such as uh, um, uh, the fuel or the uh, orientation of flaps and ailerons. And we wanna design these inputs such that the state X satisfies safety. So for example, uh, avoids unsafe airspace, 
uh, despite uncertainty. So what, uh, what we, one particular problem we've been working on is that um, they have now a lot of forecast data about the storms and location of uh, hazardous weather regions. And so, but these forecasts of course are uncertain. So here in the picture, you see the data from MIT Lincoln Lab, which shows the red regions show the uh, high uh, possibility of storms. And so, one thing that we developed is a probabilistic model of this weather forecast and the storm. So we fit basically uh, minimum volume ellipsoids on the regions uh, that have storm and we model this probabilistically. And then we try to design the aircraft trajectory that with any desired probability can avoid this. And this is based on developing stochastic safety and optimal control algorithms. Um, so this was sort of a problem that has been with me for a long time since my PhD and it's been evolving, but now going to more new problems, a similar problem arises when we have um, in autonomous driving. And here the forecast, basically we have uncertainty in um, predicting what the nearby traffic or cars would do, okay? And our control problem is to design maneuvers for the cars that can guarantee safety despite this uncertainty. And here you see the state of the art uh, forecast algorithms for trajectory prediction of the cars. And you can see that um, as the horizon goes on, the uncertainty becomes um, quite large. And in particular, sometimes they, the uncertainty also shows like a bimodality that you don't know if the car will basically go straight or turn left. And this creates challenging um, mixed integer stochastic um, control and optimization problem. And what we've been developing over the year, few, past few years is an algorithm that um, despite the uncertainty in location of nearby traffic can do different maneuvers safely. For example, a lane change and here the uncertainty is intent of the cars, um, how fast they're gonna be driving their acceleration. And we make sure that despite this uncertainty, we have a, a safe lane change. And again, here, again, we are controlling the blue car and we have uncertainty in the future trajectory of this red car, uh, whether it's gonna go straight or turn left. And again, we design this maneuver that the blue car controls its speed and slightly um, swears to make sure regardless of what this red car will do, it avoids this. And we are integrating this now with the state of art also forecast algorithms. What's up, what are some of the open challenges? One is that the uncertainty grows with time horizon. So this is from new scene um, autonomous driving data set. This is like at, give different snapshots of where the, the cars can be. And as you see, like after um, eight seconds, we have quite a lot of uncertainty about this forecast. So how do we incorporate this and come up with some safe but not too conservative algorithm that the car will still kind of progress. The other one is out of distribution data in the training. So here you see, again, the neural networks and end-to-end -end learning is being used um, to come up with what had um, the steering command for the car. And you see that the, the, the network was trained under certain lighting condition and in different lighting condition the steering command was completely um, different. So how do we deal with the fact that the data that the car will see is not always in the training set? And then the last one is random disturbances or adversarial attacks in the data. Again, this is uncertainties that, um, or attacks that can happen to the different modules of the learning algorithm. And we have to see how we can design safe um, control to be accounting for this. And this is the work of my colleague in ECE, Kartik Patap Miraman, who showed that with a single bit flip, um, in the, the learning algorithm can make such wrong decisions and interpretations. So we really have to come up with a way to ensure robustness despite this fragility and the uncertainties of these learning algorithms. And that's something I'm working on. Um, another, um, direction is that if we look at sort of control theory evolution, we're going from a model-based approach where we first model the dynamics of the car or aircraft, and then we optimize or control to a learning-based approach where we model the whole thing as a black box and we do end-to-end, -end, for example, learning. And this is motivated by the fact that a lot of systems have 
uh, are complex, either they have a lot of uncertainty or nonlinearities, and also because derivative-free optimization and neural networks have been really successful. Um, so what I've been working on is how do we guarantee safety of these um, black box learning approach? And I just present in one slide what I mean by that. So in the most abstract way, we can formulate this as minimize a cost function subject to a constraint, but this F and G are both unknown. And so we want to learn the optimizer uh, while exploring, while trying to figure out, um, exploring the feasible set, which is unknown to us. The way we can interact with the system is we can play an X and get noisy evaluation of F and noisy evaluation of G. And so basically we are looking at how to go towards this extra star while ensuring that the say um, we are exploring safety. So G of XT, the constraints at the query points are satisfied for every T. And we have been working, I've been working on this with um, one of my students and collaborators and currently another, another student, we are applying this framework in advanced manufacturing uh, where we don't have a good model of the manufacturing processes and basically we can query them and simulate them and want to make sure still that our product uh, meets some safety requirements. Okay, um, so now I just want to briefly also I'll talk about multi-agent work. Um, so as I mentioned, another challenge is that we have network of systems that are interacting and that's what a multi-agent system is. Uh, these agents are coupled uh, because the, each agent's cost function depends on action of others. Maybe easiest to see is, is in an auction, um, depending on whether um, what the other players are bidding in the auction, you may get a reward or not. Or in a transportation network, um, your travel time doesn't just depend on your choice, but also on the choice of other drivers, okay? Um, so this is uh, like a slightly different problem in the sense that each agent wants to minimize its cost function, but that function depends on the action of everybody else, okay? So how do we, what I've been looking at is how do we design X by star to optimize agents objective, despite the fact that they would have partial information about the global system. So they can only see things locally and they can also do local computation and communication. Okay. And I'll, without going to the theory, I'll just uh, show a couple of applications of this. Uh, one of them that Again, it's an application I've been interested in for a while is multi-agent control in rescue robotics. Um, so we have, here we have our agents or robots or firefighters, for example, that they want to minimize the risk of fire failure. And of course, at the system level, we also want to um, maximize the safety of the whole mission. And so for this, uh, we have been developing a theory that is kind of a two level on a high level, we do task assignment to the agents and then on a lower level, uh, we do stochastic safe planning for each of these. So what you see here is a building plan where the, um, I will just explain an example. These, these, these are walls, they're black or walls or obstacles. The red are starting location of fire. And then we have some robots that they want to reach this target um, person to rescue them and then exit. And then as time progresses, the fire evolves and oops. Um, and we've come up with ways to assign robots to tasks um, to, and to safely exit the building uh, while um, avoiding basically the fire and maximizing quality of safety of the whole mission. Another application we've been looking at is uh, efficient electricity market mechanism design. So here, as I said, it's exactly like an auction framework um, where bidders in the market submit bid about their electricity. So this is solar cells or wind powers. And then there is a central operator that assigns the payment rule and allocation rule. So how much each bidder would get paid and how much electricity they should produce. And they've been using the developing game theory to come up with how can we ensure this whole system is efficient, given that players, bidders have their own perspective of optimizing costs, whereas the social planner wants to also um, 
optimize the cost of purchasing the electricity. Uh, so finally, the last application, um, again, um, as I mentioned, is transportation networks. So here um, we apply the learning, multi-agent learning algorithms to a standard test bed, which is um, called Xerox fall, and you can model it as a graph with 24 um, edges and se uh, 24 nodes and 76 edges. And basically we looked at how we can, uh, if agents use the local learning rule, um, how much congestion can be reduced. Um, so uh, in future, I also hope to plan kind of, data, uh, hope to be able to um, use the data also, uh, work, work with collaborators in UBC to use the also campus um, data to verify this, oops. Uh, so, okay, uh, we just gave you an overview of the problems I work on. So in general, this control system is a very multidisciplinary field and um, I'm sort of always learning and uh, advances in optimization, machine learning, and trying to contribute to that, to bring it together with the practical problems we are uh, trying to solve. Um, and I work also with uh, several colleagues in the different departments, computer science, robot, uh, robotics, power system experts. Um, my current students, I just um, wanna thank them. Some of them master's students, some PhD students, uh, current collaborators, uh, these four are from UBC and few from Europe and current funding. And I'm happy to answer questions you have. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, Mariam. Um, yeah. but we do have time for one question. I see uh, uh, Kevin, Kevin's got a question. Uh, it says, okay. Uh, yes, I saw it. Uh, okay. Well, well, well let, let me just read it in case other okay. people haven't seen it. So uh, okay. I'm really interested in, in the work on intelligent uh, transportation systems. Are you solving for Nash equilibria? Uh, what are the control knobs you're optimizing over? <laughs> okay, so thank you for the question. Good question. Actually, in this one, uh, in this particular work, we looked at each agent minimizing regrets, basically, uh, just because the problem was non-convex and we cannot prove uh, we have a Nash equilibrium. So we looked at if each of the agents is using a no regret strategy, uh, how much we can use the congestion. And of course, if all of them use no regret, then you have this course correlated equilibrium, which, okay, it's weak. Uh, but mainly what we were looking at is using developing efficient no regret algorithms, given that this is not just an arbitrary banded optimization, but the game using that to, and the fact that the cost function doesn't depend um, on everyone's action, but on aggregate of the actions. So incorporating this, we could develop a um, more efficient no regret than kind of standard one, and then see that congestion can be reduced based on which percentage of the agents are using such no regret algorithm. Does that help? Because I'm still interested in the control knobs, but yeah. <laughs> okay, at the moment we didn't include dynamic. So we have included context in the game in the sense that you, based on weather or based on um, conditions of the day, the game might be different. But I have to say in the learning work, I haven't, um, it's much harder to include dynamical systems. So here the knob is only which routes you're choosing. Um, and we, it's not, it's not yet including x star equals fx for every agent because doing that problem is much harder and there is less much work on it. I mean, there is work on multi-agent reinforcement learning, but I think the theory of it is a little bit lacking or coming, uh, coming gradually. So at the moment, it's only like a contextual uh, no regret learning problem where context is um, the weather condition or road road traffic conditions, but the next step is kind of more more reinforcement learning framework. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, with that, we, we should we should uh, wrap up okay. the session. So many thanks, Mariam. Thank that you. was that was Thank great. You. Another really nice connection between lots of interesting theoretical work and and a really a, a broad spectrum of, of applications. Uh, so I, we have two fantastic uh, keynote talks coming up. So from uh, eleven fifteen to uh, which is uh, just in a few minutes from eleven fifteen to twelve forty five. So these are by uh, 
Trevor Campbell and and Ella and Ella Sheffer. So I really um, recommend that you hang around for those. At the same time, uh, I'll just uh, we'll pause briefly just to let everyone uh, catch their breath. But uh, we will uh, start those uh, at um, at eleven fifteen or or maybe a minute or two afterwards. So great, thank you all for coming to uh, this morning's session and uh, onwards.